Thanks. Well, my question more of a global scale. Yep. Um, looking at the mess that we're in right now. The um, global mess that we're living in yes, right now. Yes, yep. in the, all aspects, ecological, like you say, we all look like we damaged goods with all our emotional yep. Uh, yep. Um, damages. Um, back in the history, um, did we as a humanity came to this situation or there's been outside forces or, as we say... Um, That's a good question. Um, it depends who you define as humanity. Well, as a, as a, uh, well human beings, <laughs> yep. us. I actually define spirits as human beings too. So, um, so if, we look at, if we look at all the people who have ever died, and they are all human still, in my, my feelings, and all of the people who are currently on Earth, and yes, as a collective total, we created today's situation. That's very true. So there was no outside help? There was um, no um, manipulation? No. It's, it's, if I can describe what happened. So initially God created all of us little souls that had yet to incarnate, right? When we incarnated, of course, we go through the process of separation from our soulmate. And obviously we get the two bodies, the spirit and material bodies, that are a part of that creation. All right? Sorry about the dress there, girls. And, and our soul separates in that process of incarnation. Now, God created, God created firstly a pristine universe. And the beauty of what... One of the amazing things about God is that I personally feel the more amazing thing about God is not what she created, but what she created as the potential to exist. Um, and in other words, the laws that she created, I actually feel are even more powerful than what she created. Because it's the laws that she created that created a whole group of potentialities of new things that we are then partly creating ourselves as a, as a part of God's creation. And the beauty of what God created is, yes, God created us as perfect souls and we incarnated, but God also gave us, as a part of this beautiful gift, the gift of free will. And the gift of free will, while many of us may have judgment about it in our current state, the truth is it's the, it's the most beautiful gift you can imagine giving anyone. It's, uh, and, and you look at it even with your own children sometimes, uh, those of you who have had children, you'll realise that it's such a beautiful gift you can give them, this gift of allowing them to do exactly what they want at any point in time, taking full responsibility in that point in time for all of their actions. And it's a beautiful gift and God gave us this gift which when we incarnated we started to experiment with. So from the moment that you entered your mother's womb you are now experimenting with the gift of this free of free will. You know, in your mother's womb, you you know, you stretch your leg and you experience the the free will inside of the womb as much as you can of seeing a little foot, foot poke out for a, for a moment, and that's the little child already beginning to experiment with its own will. Something that mum probably didn't appreciate at the time, particularly if it was kicking into her bladder or something like that. So right from that moment, from the, from the time the child in, in, incarnated, they're experiencing this gift of free will and starting to express it. Now in the process of expressing it, we have choice. And one of the primary choices that God gave us is this choice to be self-reliant or the choice to be God-reliant. And uh, if I could put that down as the primary choice that many of us still actually face right now, right? Self-reliance or God-reliance? One of those two things. Now, the majority of us have sometimes God-reliance, sometimes self-reliance. That's how we live our life. You know, sometimes what we do is we have self-reliance most of the time until it gets too hard for ourselves. And then we decide in that moment, which is usually a moment of crisis, uh, to be God-reliant for a few moments, sometimes a day, a week, a month, or whatever. And then because of all sorts of external factors, we go straight back into self-reliance. That's often what we do. But the first human couple who were created also had the same choice. 
and they had the choice of self-reliance and God-reliance. Now, for many years, they, they chose God-reliance. They started growing and cho choosing to God-reliance. But then they realised that actually they felt that they would like to be God. In other words, to have total control of everything. So, so at the moment, if you could think of God, God has created all of these laws so that anarchy cannot exist in her universe. But what man wants to do is break as many of the laws as possible. And the reason why we do want to do that is because we want to believe that we are gods. And one of the most damaging teachings on this planet, I feel, is actually the belief that we are gods. Because when we start believing that we are gods, we start feeling that we have the right to make the law. And in reality, the laws are already made. And I can imagine I have the right to make the law as much as I want, but the, the actual truth is that God's already made all the laws that are necessary for the entire universe to operate. And in the process of that, I start choosing self-reliance because I start feeling like I want to make my own rules. I want to live my life by my own rules. Not understanding that just like a car has been designed by somebody and if you do to that car what the manufacturer says there's a pretty good chance you get a long life out of the car. But if you, you do what, the opposite to what the manufacturer says, there's a pretty good chance the life of the vehicle is going to be much shortened. The same applies to our soul. And that is, if I do what the manufacturer designed for my soul to do, my soul will grow and expand and keep growing and expanding forever. But if I decide to choose self-reliance, what I'm going to finish up doing is being limiting my growth. And in fact, in many cases shrinking my soul because I'm actually doing the opposite to what is good for my own soul. And so what happened was the first human couple decided this course of self-reliance and, and, and by the way it's the same choice every one of us face today. And this choice whether you're perfect or not is a choice you are confronted with every moment of your life. Are you going to be God-reliant or are you going to be self-reliant? That's the choice we face. Now in the process of choosing self-reliance Every single thing that you call the mess on earth today has been created. Every single thing. And I had a talk recently with a group of people in Butterham and I said, let's for a moment separate what God has created from what people have created. Because this is what we forget to do. You know, most of the time what we do is we look at the whole world and we say God created that. And the truth is that God only created the potential of that by giving you free will. So let's look at what God actually created and what we actually created. Now, God created trees, mountains, you know, all of, the, all of the ecosystems that we see, they are all the things God created. What does man do with them? Well, man gets them and gets the best of it and turns it into the worst of it. That's what we do. So what we, do, what we did in Australia, for example, is we found the biggest trees and what did we do with them? We didn't put a protection around and say, this is the biggest tree, we're going to honour this tree. What did we do instead? We saw it down and we used it in a house and we only leave the smallest trees, um, which often take, what, six, seven, eight hundred years to grow to those biggest trees. And so now it's very rare for us to go into a forest where there's actually 800-year-old or 1,000-year-old trees. Like, you, you can, in Queensland, you can drive for, for thousands of kilometres without seeing one even though there's forests everywhere. And the reason why is because we take what God has created, this pristine thing God has created, and out of our self-reliance, we're no longer trusting that everything's going to be provided for us, so we've got to provide for ourselves. So what we decide to do is get the biggest tree, cut it down, turn it into blocks of wood that we can build a house with, not realising that actually what we've done is destroyed the environment for generations. You know, in the case of a tree, usually for another 10 generations, we've destroyed the environment just in that one act. And, and we've got to start looking at what we're creating through self-reliance. Every single problem we have on earth, so let's look at them. We've got the problem of economics on the earth at the moment, right? Where man has become self-reliant in terms of who gets what. So in other words, I, economics is not the even distribution of money, as you well know. Economics is... A, decide, a power play of the persons in power as to who gets what. And what we finish up doing with our so-called economics is we rate the poorer countries so the richer countries can get richer 
and, and then we rate the, rich, the poorer people in the richer countries so the richer people in the richer countries can get richer and in the end it all goes back and funnels back into some very few people on this planet that actually have the power in the in the so when does it end? Yeah. Then we've got the environmental problems, right? Right, we no longer trust that we can look after ourselves in a manner that's uh, harmonious with the environment because we've become self-reliant, we're not God-reliant anymore, we don't know how things really work anymore. And so what we do is we rely on our own intuition and our own knowledge of how things work, which is often very flawed. And what we do is we finish up destroying the environment just through our day-to-day -day acts. Many of us totally unconscious of what's going on on a day-to-day -day level even in terms of our life and how it is in destroying the environment. And we could start listing everything, couldn't we? We could start listing the medical profession. Medicine. Right? Politics. You know, all these different areas where, where the world is out of harmony. Right? And out of harmony with love. We know, we know it's out of harmony with love. And if it's out of harmony with love, it's automatically out of harmony with truth. And this is another thing that we need to understand inside of ourselves is if something isn't loving, it also is untruthful. Right? So there's no truth in it either. So the, the current economic system, environmental system, medical system, political system, and so on and so on and so on, all these different systems we've created out of our own self-reliance have all been created because in the original place we walked away from God. Because when you... When you walk away from God, you're left with your own experimentation without God. That's the problem. And when you're left with your own experimentation without God, you've got to go through what's called this scientific method, which isn't really very scientific, because the most scientific thing to do would be to connect to the person who created everything and get him to tell you how everything works. That would be the most scientific and logical thing to do. But what we do instead is we say, no, no, we can't connect with the person. Most of us have actually come to the point where we don't even believe that person exists. So how can you connect to a person who you feel doesn't exist? And then secondly, if we do believe he exists, we believe he's a punishing God, so we can't connect to him there. And then the, we have many other beliefs which prevent the connection. So in the end, that leaves us only free to experiment. And when we experiment, we start creating an ec economic system that's very self-reliant, not God-reliant, is not based around God's principles, based around what we think is right. And then we create an environmental system and a medical system and a political system and every other system that we've created. And every one of them has so much lack of harmony with love in them. And it all begins from the one emotion. This emotion that I want to determine my own life, thank you very much, and I'm not going to listen to God about my life. That's where it begins. But I, I, I don't see people changing uh, or fighting against the government because the, the government don't, don't, don't let us breathe, you know? And, um, yep, well, there's, there's unless, really... unless you're going to fly in a, in a white robe and everyone will get convinced and well, they'll, well, they'll change their view. Well, Otherwise, could, people will just... You could fly in a white robe and everyone could be convinced. <laughs> not yet. So, so don't put it all on me that I've got to do it and you get away with not doing it. But secondly... Um, there's, two, there's two points that we need to realise with any change. The first one is that something is wrong. We need to admit to ourselves that something is wrong. So many of us don't even want to admit to ourselves in our own life that something is wrong, let alone that something is wrong in a bigger sense, like in the worldwide sense, right? So first, the first step is to admit to ourselves that in our own life something is wrong. Right? So I, I have to come to an acknowledgement of myself that I am in a place of self-reliance I'm not in a place of God-reliance, that there's something wrong with that. Why do I choose that? It's because I've got this emotion, that emotion, this emotion. I need to be open to feeling. And if I open myself up to feeling, I will automatically, if I long for God's love, open myself up to God. And as a result of that, my heart will start to change. And as my heart changes, my brightness increases. And as my brightness increases, so does everyone else's notice of the brightness increasing. So as, and this is what I meant by your, let your light shine to the world. So as you deal with your emotions and release the negative emotions and become more God-reliant, this light or brightness increases in you and everyone around you and all the spirits around you see it and as a result of that, they say, I, I want something of what he's got. You know, like, what has he got? There's something he's got that I, I don't feel, but I, I, I like it, you know. And they then start 
wanting to listen to extra truth as a result of that and this is how change will occur. Once one of us chooses in a certain location to live this life, you'll find automatically around you other people start choosing. But we're so dependent on the system. Um, well, that, you will go through an emotion that, where you will not be, be dependent on the system anymore. And you'll actually start living your life independent of the system. And that's what I meant by saying you will be in the world but not of the world. Does that make sense? What will happen is you'll get to a point where you deal with different emotions and you'll start realising, actually, this system doesn't define how I will live my life anymore. Yeah, but if I go against it, I'll, I'll be put in jail or something like that. Well, no, see, no, that, that's, a, you, if, in, that's a fear. You see, and fear is one of the biggest things we need to get rid of within ourselves. And remember, we get rid of it by feeling it, not by denying it. So, yes, that is a statement of fear, and for the majority of us, that fear will be realised while I have that fear within me. But if I, if I release that fear, I'll get to a point where I love the system. Remember, you'll get to the point where you love everything, which means also loving the system that you're living in. And you'll love it enough to see its error, but also be able to act in a way that's loving towards it. Now, when you do that, you'll find you'll confront the system but the system won't bite you in the bottom every time you confront the system anymore because you're in a state where there's no fear. And it's the fear that attracts the, the rear-end kicks that we get from the system. Does that make sense? So, so the reality is, as we deal with our emotions, right, what will happen of fear, release those emotions of fear, we'll get into a higher state of love. As we get into a higher state of love, the system that we we're afraid of, we're no longer afraid of anymore. And because we're no longer afraid of it anymore, it harms us less. Because anything we're afraid of automatically has a law of attraction. But it might take a long time, you know. And you're not denying that... Now the... you're expressing another fear. <laughs> Can you see that? Yeah, but you're not denying that there's some earth changing coming up. Yeah, but I'm not afraid of them. I think they're going to be a good thing. Um, I'm, not af I'm not denying there's going to be economic collapse, and there will be. But, but I'm not afraid of that either. I think it's going to be a good thing. It's my fear of these things that generates them in more intensity. If I, I can't wait for it. <laughs> yep. But, but in a way, you say, but, but you've got to be very careful of this emotion that you do have, and that is, I can't wait for it, but what do I do in between now and then? Well, what you do in between now and then is you learn how to love and live in truth 100% of the time, come what may. That's what you do between now and then. And if you can do that, it'll come quicker. These changes will come quicker because you'll be a part of those changes. It'll, they'll come faster, but also you'll be in a state where you can live in that place without the economic system that we have now, without the medica, med medical system we have now, without the political system we have now, and you'll be comfortable living in that place. To be frank with you, there'll be millions of people on this planet in a totally uncomfortable position living in that place. You imagine for a moment, in the US of A, if you wiped out law, every single person there pretty much has a gun. Now, how many people are afraid in the USA, do you feel, are actually afraid of wiping out law? Now, in the end, we don't need any other law than God's laws. So in the end, all mankind's laws are going to go. So, so imagine in the U living in the USA, you're there sitting in Texas, right? and, and where, where the, the, everyone in the population pretty much has a gun, and they've all got their shells in their you know, upstairs room and their guns stored in their closet, and all of a sudden they've got no food, and they've got no water, and they've got no e economic means of getting those things. What do you think is going to result in that moment? With the ones who are afraid, what's going to happen? They're going to exercise their fear and within three to five days... Anarchy. Anarchy. Mm -hmm, yeah. But when you say you're going to love the system when you deal well, when with your emotions, how can you, when you say, when you talk, you're teaching us truth, how can we love the system when we see the, the environmental damage, the oil spills, the cutting down of the trees? How can we um, go along with that? Well, can I just relate it to how God feels about us? God loves us even though we're doing all of these damaging things. God hasn't abandoned us. 
we walk away from God. So, so the truth is that when I'm at one with God, I can also love a person who's cutting down a tree. Right? And I can actually respect the fact that that's where they're at and that's, I don't have to agree with them cutting down the tree, but I'm not going to violently oppose them cutting down the tree. I'm not going to strap myself to the tree while they stop themselves from cutting it, to try to stop them from cutting it down, because I respect their free will and I love them. And so I say, well, if you want to cut down my tree, you can cut down my tree. But it's not the right thing to do. It's not a loving thing to do. But I, because I'm not invested in the fact that this is my tree or my thing or my that, just like God isn't invested in it either, God allows people to cut down his trees. And God, you don't see God screaming with rage with a you know, pitchfork coming down saying, you cut down my trees and I'm going <laughs> you know, to get you in some way. God doesn't do that, so you won't do that. You will actually love the person even in their act of doing something that's unloving. That's the love, the amount of love that you'll have. You'll be able to love them even in their act of them trying to torture you. Uh, you'll be able to love them in that situation. You won't feel afraid anymore. That's where God is and that's where you will be when you're at one with God. Now, now in the interim, obviously, I'm not there. So I've got this fear that I need to work on and I've got this anger I need to work on, I've got this grief that I need to work on and I can choose to work on it relying on God through the process or I can choose to avoid it. Now if I choose to work on it I am now helping the planet heal. If I choose to avoid it then I am being a part of this system that's damaging the, 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 the earth. So to give you an example just the one act of eating meat let's just look at that one act. Now Many of us wouldn't go and slit the lamb's throat. So you imagine a little baby lamb in front of you and you're asked to slit its throat, skin it, gut it and then eat it. Now by the time most of you in the audience would have done the first three things, the fourth, the eating of it, would be pretty impossible for us in that place, right? And, and if we connect with our emotions, we can feel how terrible it feels to actually kill a living thing and then do all of those things to it, right? And we can feel it inside of ourselves. Then if we look at the damage that's being done to the environment because we're eating meat, there are whole, like all of the, um, pretty much all of the forests of the earth are being destroyed in order, in order to create beef uh, um, stations, pretty much. And, and the majority of them are coming because we want meat, right? So all of a sudden, all of that would also stop. So environment... So let's look at it. Firstly, environmental things would stop as soon as I chose to not eat meat, if we did it on a collective level, I'm saying. You know, the, a lot of the economic system would change very rapidly. Instead of us being dependent on meat, we'd have more focus on other vegetables and other things. And because vegetables can be grown in smaller locations, we'd destroy less of the environment as a, as a result. If you look at what's going on in terms of power, the beef barons or whatever in many of these countries that are doing this destruction would no longer have the power because they only have power through demand and we're no longer providing a demand. So, so therefore the power structure all changes just automatically by us choosing to eat fruit and vegetables. Does that make sense? It's just that one loving act. So all of a sudden I'm just changing one thing in my life, just one, and now that one thing is going to have an impact on the rest of the world. And if we did that collectively, you imagine the huge impact it would have. At the moment, very few native animals exist anywhere in the world because of our desire to eat meat. And, and in Australia even, what we do is we burn a lot of the undergrowth forests. Like in Queensland, you see this happening everywhere. Where what we do is we get, poison a lot of the big trees, cut them all down. Some of them are used for timber. Some of them they are just still standing there dead. And then what we do is we burn the undergrowth. Now, in the process of burning all the undergrowth, what happens is all of the native wildlife, all the smaller native birds and animals that need this undergrowth to survive, can't survive anymore. So they all just automatically die off. So now, you know, we've got like, in, in just one little location in New South Wales, there's 1,200 endangered species of, of animals and birds. Like... 1,200 endangered species. So just because of our desire to do this for the sake of our eating meat. And at some point we've got to say to ourselves, is this all worth it? And is also, is this all loving? And if it's not, what causes the desire to eat meat inside of myself? What, what emotion 
inside of myself drives me to eat meat. And when I address that issue and bring that, just that one issue into harmony with love, we have the power to change so many things in the world just from that one issue. Now imagine if all of us did that with five different issues, not just the issue of eating meat, but the issue of how we treated women, how we treated men, how we treated children and so forth. You imagine then the changes that would happen, quite large changes. Do you want to come up here and speak? One of Mary's favourite subjects. So. <laughs> it is. I always uh, talk about this subject because when I met AJ, as like lots of people have probably heard me say by now, I was full of anger at the system and I wanted to change the world and I was involved in humanitarian things, environmental things. I was really... Um, I had a lot of rage and when I met AJ, I was very confronted because he said what he just said to you, you know, in the end you're going to love those things. You're going to love the system. And I could, I could connect to a desire to, yeah, maybe I want to love people, but I don't ever want to love that system because it just is abhorrent to me. Um, but what I realised when I started on this path is I actually had a lot of really deep grief about feeling the hopelessness that um, I felt like... I felt so cynical, I felt that it can't change. I can feel everything horrible that's happening out there and it, and it can't change. And I didn't want to feel the grief of that, so I got angry and I wanted to take action in order to avoid that grief. Uh, and so I did some grieving about it uh, and I've probably still got more there because uh, I still sometimes find it really hard to hope uh, that this dream that we have is going to come to fruition. Um, but what I, have do, what I have come to after feeling some of that grief um, was a deeper sense of compassion and a knowledge about emotions that everyone who um, is cutting down the tree or who's going to war is in deep fear, that they're not feeling something. And um, it's only through their ability to feel their emotions that they will change their actions. And... I decided that's where I want to change the world. I want to do that for myself. I want to be not be afraid of any emotion so that I can live freely and in love all of the time. Yeah. We, we watched a... Um, what did we watch? We watched Saving Private Ryan recently, and it's a movie that I could never watch before, and um, I cried pretty much from the opening credits to the end ones. But at the end of it, I came out of it with this deepened resolve because I could feel everyone in that movie was avoiding an emotion. They weren't, they weren't feeling like they could feel their terror, they weren't feeling like they could make a different choice, that they had to avoid what was happening there, that they, um, they couldn't forgive because they were carrying all this grief that they weren't letting themselves feel. And um, at the end of it, I, just, I felt the only way we're ever going to change the world is for any of us to have the feeling inside of us, I can cope with any emotion and I can feel it to its end. And that's the only way I'll be able to make a more loving choice. Yeah. So, obviously, Mary and myself have, uh, and maybe I should speak for myself only, <laughs> um, have a deep desire... To, to get across to everyone that actually when you choose to feel your own emotions about things, things around you will automatically change. And as things around you automatically change, other people will be attracted to you because of the things around you changing. And as a result of that, they will then start to desire the same kind of change. And as they desire the same kind of change, they then affect everyone around them in the way in which they change. And as a result of that, we've finished up having thousands and thousands, eventually hundreds of thousands and eventually millions of people and eventually billions of people living in a state of love with each other and not in a state of fear. Because remember, fear really, the, the base fear comes from this act of self-reliance. And the problem with self-reliance is we get to a point where we say, I have to feel everything that's inside of me. And then I go, whoa, 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 I don't want to feel that. That's, that's too intense. And we actually, from a very young age now, are being taught that we're incapable of coping with our own emotion. We're taught that, that we need other people to actually help us feel our own emotion. Yeah, how many of us are taught it's dangerous to feel your own emotion unless a psychologist is present? Like, that, that's so prevalent now on the planet. Like, where You've got to be with somebody who knows their business about emotions before you're able to feel your own emotion. 
And like, can you imagine saying that to your baby? Like, mm-hmm. oh, don't cry, you know, we've got to send you to the psychologist first, you know. Mm-hmm. And of course not. The baby is totally comfortable feeling its own emotions and yet by the time we're an adult, we're totally uncomfortable with it. And so as Mary said, like, without our, our belief in ourselves that we are capable of coping with every single emotion that is thrown at us, and we are capable of feeling it inside of ourselves without damaging another person. We are totally capable of that. And once we start believing we are totally capable of that, then we have the then we are in a in a place where we can actually change the world, because we will start affecting people around us having the same feeling. And uh, and while and the question you began with with this is how long is it going to take basically? And, and my feelings are it can happen in a very rapid time. But it needs a group of people who are first in this place where they understand it and understand the power of connecting to your own emotions fully and connecting to God fully. And when you're in this powerful place emotionally, now you have the ability to help everyone around you to be in that same powerful place. And, and we need a good few thousand of people like that, you know, people who are in that place and if you start with a few thousand people like that, um, and initially to get a few thousand, we need a few hundred. And then to get a few hundred, we need a 10 or 20. And to get 20 or 20, we need one or two. So that's how it starts, right? We get one or two, 10 or 20, a few hundred, a few thousand of us in that place. Can you imagine if there's a few thousand of us in Australia in this place? Everyone around, like, this is so-called a six degrees of separation between people. In other words... I know someone who knows you personally six steps away from me, you know. So, so um, the truth is that we are so tightly connected with each other, we just don't realise it a lot of the times. But, but sooner or later, your change, I'm going to get to see. When you change, I'll see it at some point in my life because there's only six steps between you and me in terms of people. And if you, if you bear that in mind, what that means is as you change, sooner or later, I will see it. And sooner or later, I'll go, wow, like, that's different, he's different. I I'll want some of that. Sooner or later, I will. Sooner or later, I'll connect with that within myself. And so all we need at the moment is really 10, 20, 30, 50, 100, 1,000, a couple of thousand people in that place. And then you imagine a couple of thousand people in that place and then an economic system changes because of different things that happen. So all of a sudden imagine that everyone on earth lost all of their savings in one economic downturn. Now that's going to bring up a lot of emotions for most of us, isn't it? Just that one thing. Now if a, if, if a thousand of us are prepared for that, emotionally prepared for that, we're in a place where we know how to handle all of that. Now can you imagine what all the others are going to... They're all going to be attracted to the thousand who are in that place, aren't they? How do you live your life? You seem to still not be affected by it all. How come that is? What's going on for you? How, how did you get to that place? Why aren't you upset? You know? Why aren't you afraid? And then you imagine then if there, all of a sudden there's big earth changes that occur and you're not afraid. You're in this powerful place where you've dealt with that fear as well and you're not afraid there either. You imagine everyone who's been affected by those earth changes, are gonna, at soon, sooner or later they're going to come to you. Why aren't you afraid? What's going on with you? Why, you know, what, what, and, and these are all opportunities then that you have to teach them the truth of to why you're not afraid anymore and why you feel the way you feel now. Now, if we had a thousand people in that space, just imagine, like, like, like what myself and Mary have noticed is just, just in now travelling around, so you could say two people in the place, there's thousands of people who are influenced in that place as a result influenced not influenced by me telling them what to do but influenced in their heart to actually make changes in their own lives and you're one of them it looks like there's close to like 80 or 90 maybe 100 people right now imagine if there's all of us in that place just for a moment and in that place what other people are going to see around us and they will then be influenced to also get into a similar place Sorry, if we can just have the mic back up there and you can... I've got so many questions, I can <laughs> talk all day. Um, it's like a hundred monkey effect, yeah? Um, yeah, I don't know if I agree with the hundred monkey principle, <laughs> but it's, we could call it the same thing, yeah. In other words, 
when your soul changes, it's going to have an effect on the rest of the world. Definitely. And if enough of our souls change, even one of our souls changing has an effect on the rest of the world. Like, you, you look back 2,000 years, one person changing had an effect on the world. One person. So how did that happen? Just you, one person changing. Yeah. Not a hundred of you. You don't need a hundred of you. One person is going to affect the rest of the world.